This video is made possible by NordVPN. Start protecting your internet experience today at nordvpn.com forward slash brain food. Use the code brain food to get 84% off two great gifts, four months of NordVPN and NordLocker for free. A popular misconception holds that perception happens entirely in the brain, and the billions of neurons in the body are merely messengers that send raw data to the central processor. In fact, at least in mammals, the neurons in the retina analyze complex information well before that data is sent on to your bean. This happens because depending on the type and location of the neural cell in the retina, it will be triggered by different kinds of stimuli, such as light or motion. In a 1964 study, it was found that certain groups of nerve cells in the retinas of rabbits were even triggered by size, direction, and speed. In fact, for some cells, only movement in a certain direction would trigger them, such that movement in the other direction would not, a process termed direction selectivity. More than one cell is needed to determine direction, and together they conduct at least a primitive analysis of data prior to sending it on through the optic nerve to the brain. However, until quite recently, no one was precisely sure how these various neural cells connected and communicated. Several types of visual nerve cells have to cooperate for direction to be perceived. Photoreceptors, bipolar neurons, and starburst amacrine cells. The photoreceptors are triggered by light hitting the retina, whereby they send an electrical signal to the border cell that forwards the signal cell to the starburst amacrine cells. These starburst cells, think of a bicycle wheel and its spokes, have numerous tiny filaments called dendrites extending out in a myriad of directions, making complex connections and pathways that are difficult to track. Eventually, though, information is sent from the starburst to a collection of nerve cells called a ganglion, which ultimately sends the partly analyzed data to the brain. On this note, tapping into people's insatiable appetite for new ways to distract themselves from life, Ivy League researchers made a key element of their work solving the riddle of how the eye perceives motion and direction into a game. Specifically, the neuroscientists first needed to create a map of the retina's neural pathways out of its daunting number of possible connections. Knowing that many hands and touchpads make light work, they developed a program where online gamers used their skill sets to map those connections and, in the process, do something productive in spite of themselves. As to the specific project, before any connections could be mapped, a high-quality 3D image of the retina had to first be produced. Initially, a mouse retina was sliced into many super-thin pieces, and these were scanned by an electron microscope. After they were put together, a 3D image was created, and this was then turned into an eye-wire game where, to quote them, players are challenged to map branches of a neuron from one side of a cube to the other. Think of it as a 3D puzzle. Players scroll through the cube, measuring about 4.5 microns per side, or 10 times smaller than the average width of a human hair, and reconstruct neurons in volumetric segments with the help of an artificial intelligence algorithm developed at Xiong Lab. For this Starburst challenge, the best 2,000 gamers were able to successfully map enough of the retina for the researchers to discern at least one of the pathways used in direction detection. The scientists were so appreciative of the contributions of their gamers, the IOIRAs were included as co-authors on the academic paper when the findings were published. So, what did their results show in terms of how the retina detects motion? Essentially, it was found that for each dendrite on a starburst cell, a particular type of bipolar cell, BC3, would be attached outwards along the dendrite, and another type of bipolar cell, BC2, would be attached near the hub. The two types of bipolar cells fire at different rates, with the BC2 having a longer delay. When light moves into view, it stimulates the photoreceptors, which cause both types of bipolar cells to fire. Frequently, the messages from the two types of cells along a dendrite will reach the starburst cell at different times, in no small part due to BC2's greater time delay. However, when an object in view moves along the direction of a given dendrite, the messages sent from its two types of bipolar cells, BC2 and BC3, which in turn will be sufficiently impressed that it sends a signal to its ganglion cell. Thus, in a nutshell, the orientation of the strongest firing dendrite ends up telling the brain the direction the object is moving. 
Of course, more research is needed, as only a small fraction of the retina's pathways have been mapped, and as noted by the authors of the paper, there are likely other neural cells involved in motion detection. So just before we get into today's great bonus fact all about what those random things that sometimes float across your vision are, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, NordVPN. Look, if you're buying things online and using a public Wi-Fi spot, you know, think about if you're out and about in a coffee shop or something, you really should be using a VPN, and that's where NordVPN comes in. Now, I know it's tempting not to bother. I've certainly been in that position myself, but really, you know, those stories you read about people having their data stolen, their accounts broken into, they really do happen, and it could happen to you, but not if you've got Nord. Whenever I'm browsing on public Wi-Fi, I just keep a VPN running in the background all the time so I don't have to worry about anyone stealing my data. But it's not all about security. You can also use it to change the country that you appear to be in, so you can get content that might normally only be available in specific geographic locations wherever you live in the world. Now, you might have heard about the Nord breach in the news recently, but it's important to point out that no user information was exposed because NordVPN doesn't keep any logs on its servers because it doesn't keep any logs at all. However, NordVPN are still moving to a 100% owned server model. Unlike other VPNs, they're also improving other aspects of their security. So start protecting your internet experience today at nordvpn.com forward slash brain food. Use the code brain food to get 84% off two great gifts, four months of NordVPN and NordLocker for free. And now let's get into that bonus fact. Ever wonder what causes those mysterious objects in your vision which appear to float around? And if you ever try to look at them too closely and track their movement, they seem to evade being focused on? Well, wonder no more. To begin with, for those who've never experienced this phenomenon, eye floaters, for lack of a better term, are little oddly shaped objects that appear in your vision, often when one looks at a bright light such as a blue sky. Their shapes vary greatly, but will often appear as spots, cobwebs, or randomly shaped stringy objects. These are not optical illusions, but rather something your eyes are actually perceiving. There are a few different things that can cause this, but in most cases, these eye floaters are caused by pieces of the gel-like vitreous breaking off from the back portion of your eye and then floating about in your eyeball. The vitreous humor, or often just called vitreous, is a clear gel that fills the gap between your retina and lens lens, helping maintain the round shape of your eye in the process. This gel is about 99% water and 1% other elements, the latter of which consists mostly of a network of hyaluronic acid and collagen. Hyaluronic acid ends up retaining water molecules. Over time, though, this network breaks down, which results in the hyaluronic acid releasing its trapped water molecules. When this happens, it forms a watery core in your vitreous body. As you age, then, pieces of the still gel-like collagen hyaluronic acid network will break off and float around in this watery center. When light passes through this area, it creates a shadow on your retina. This shadow is actually what you're seeing when you see eye floaters. Children and teenagers almost never experience these types of eye floaters, as there must first be some deterioration of the gel-like substance in their eye, which creates the watery core. However, they still do sometimes experience a certain type of eye floater that often appears more like a crystallized web across their vision. These floaters aren't found in the vitreous humor like the above floaters. Instead, they are found in the premacular bursa area right on top of the retina. These ones are microscopic in size and only appear as big as they do because of their proximity to the retina. Unfortunately, their microscopic nature makes them almost impossible to treat in most cases. Another interesting thing about eye floaters is that if they would just stay still instead of floating around, your brain would automatically tune them out and you'd never consciously see them. Your brain does this all the time with things both in and outside of your eyes. One example of this inside your eye are blood vessels in the eye which obstruct light because they are fixed in location relative to the retina. Indeed, your brain tunes these out completely and you don't consciously perceive them. And as for the reason you can see floaters better when looking at, for instance, a bright blue sky, it is because your pupils contract to a very small size, thus reducing the aperture, which in turn makes floaters more apparent and focused. As for the reason the floating specks never seem to stay still, this is because floaters, being suspended in vitreous humor, move when your eye moves. So as you try to look at them, they will appear to drift with your eye movement. Finally, if you ever see a ton of floaters appear out of nowhere, possibly with some light flashes, you should get to an eye doctor immediately. There is a chance, about one in seven, that your retina is about to detach from the back of your eye. If that happens, you have very little time to get it fixed before it effectively dies and you go blind in that eye. 
On that note, floaters can damage the retina by tugging on it, sometimes producing a tear. When a tear happens, vitreous can invade the opening in the tear, which will ultimately widen the gap and in 50% of those cases will result in the retina eventually becoming fully detached, if not repaired via surgery. And as for what is causing the light flashes here, these are not caused by actual light, but rather will often occur when the photoreceptors in the retina receive stimulation from being touched or from being torn. This produces an electrical impulse to your brain, which your brain more or less interprets as a light flash. This physical stimulation is often caused when traction is being applied while the vitreous detachment is taking place. These flashes will often temporarily occur when you get a sharp blow to the head. The sudden jarring causes pressure on the retina. This in turn creates an electrical impulse to the brain, which the brain interprets as a flash. Yet another potential cause of these flashes is with migraine headaches, which are usually caused by a spasm of blood vessels in the brain. In this case, you will experience the flashes in both eyes at the same time, often followed by an extreme headache, though this isn't necessarily the case. Basically, if you are experiencing these flashes in both eyes at the same time, it is likely caused by either severe head trauma, which resulted in damage to both of your retinas, or more likely some form of ophthalmic migraine. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor, NordVPN. Link to them below. And as always, thank you for watching.